Iron Maiden's Eddie is more than just a band's mascot. His family. After more than 40 years, Eddie became not only the symbol of Iron Maiden, but also one of the symbols of heavy metal itself. And so first of all, let's take a look at the origins of Eddie and hopefully answer the question of how it is so that this mascot helped Iron Maiden become one of the greatest heavy metal bands of all times. Here you go. By the way, as always, please do not hesitate to comment on anything you hear or see in this video, and especially if I mess something up, because the whole point of it is, of course, to start a conversation. But alright, let's do it. In a weird and a rather indirect way, Eddie actually owes its life to nobody else but Gene Simmons of KISS. What? Yes, Iron Maiden's second vocalist, Dennis Wilcock, who replaced Paul Day back in 1976, was a huge KISS fan. So huge that he actually insisted on him performing on stage only wearing a face paint and spilling fake blood from his mouth as he'd run a sword across his lips. Just like somebody else I know of. His onstage appearance did not exactly fit with the rest of the band's imagery, and after much drama which caused major lineup shuffles into which I do not intend to go into in this particular episode, in the spring of 1978, Dennis actually decides to leave Iron Maiden just a little over two and a half years before Maiden actually went on tour with his musical heroes. By the way, Dennis left Iron Maiden to form his own band called V1 which actually might have broken some kind of a world record because they did release their first studio album 40 years after its original formation. Yep, all the way in 2017. After parting ways with Dennis, Steve Harris and the crew had an entire summer to come up with a way to reglamorize the stage now that there was no band member with a face paint on. And so after getting the band back on track with the new vocalist Paul Diano, Iron Maiden found a way to recreate the ambiance created by Dennis's on stage appearance and basically find someone who would do, well apart from singing of course, but exactly the same thing spill blood. The first incarnation of what was later to become Eddie was a simple kabuki mask connected to a fish pond pump which would basically spill fake blood by the end of the show. <coughs> by the way, because of its new placement on top of the stage and right above the drummer, Doug Samson would actually be full covered in blood by the end of the show. We don't know if it was because of that or some other reason, but either way, later on the mask got a major update and started doing something previously unimaginable. Release red smoke from its mouth. And while the first one was made out of a papier mache by an art student who happened to be a friend of Dave Beasley, the latter was made by Dave himself out of a fiberglass. And in addition to just releasing red smoke, it actually had those flashy eyes which would later on be replicated on the Eddie we all know today. By the time the band was ready to release their first studio album, the band's longtime manager Rod Smallwood actually thought that Iron Maiden lacked something. What? And in order to bring more attention to themselves, they actually would need a crazy ass lunatic central figure. You see, despite their crazy energy, everyone in the band, including Paul Diana, who actually was rather vicious on stage. Sorry to ruin your image, Paul. Were actually rather shy people. And so Rod actually thought that it was right about time to give that little mask which appeared on stage something called a body. While working on the album artwork, Rod Smallwood set up a meeting with an artist called Derek Riggs, who brought all of the illustrations he had to show to the band, among which of course was what was to become Iron Maiden's first album artwork. By the time he met with the band, the image was pretty much done, including of course the iconic lamppost, which by the way is still there. The only thing which actually was different is that Derek's Addy originally was almost bold. Yet since Iron Maiden were a heavy metal band and they wanted Addy to look a little bit more up to their style of music, they actually asked Riggs to add some extra hair to the illustration. And two combs for fluffy curls. Speaking about styles, according to Derek, the original illustration was actually created for a punk record and was actually inspired by an American skull on a Vietnamese tank. But I'm suspicious about this. I think it was a ploy by the American government to gain sympathy. Being a great long-term thinking manager he is, Rod Small would actually realize that this creature actually has a great visual continuity. And therefore, if Iron Maiden want to continue using him both on stage and on consecutive album artworks, they need a little backstory for him. And so Eddie's first appearance was actually on the band's first ever single, Running Free, on which you can actually see that there is someone standing in the back, yet you're not exactly sure who he is. Yet all of this of course becomes clear with the release of Iron Maiden's debut album, on which the long-haired Eddie appears in all of his 
well, beauty. Fun fact, Derek Riggs actually remained the exclusive artist who draw all of the Addis all the way until 1992. On Fear of the Dark, Iron Maiden decided that it is time to update Eddie for the 90s and started inviting all of the greatest artists from all around the world to participate in the process of their album artwork creation, including, of course, legendary Mark Wilkinson, whom all of those who are not new to the show should know pretty well by now, and who, of course, decided the latest Addy on Sinjutsu. Yet, if you're attentive, you know that Sinjutsu is not the very first time when Addy is actually holding a samurai sword. The original Eddie the Samurai, who looked something like that, appeared all the way back in 1981, so roughly 40 years ago. It cannot be. By the way, a couple of weeks ago, as part of our Up the Iron series, I actually created a short video in which I gathered, which seems to be all of the official Eddies who ever appeared on either the band's studio albums, singles or live albums under one minute, so if you haven't yet, make sure to check it out. And now that the band revealed the new Addy on the album cover, it was time to update the stage one up to the new standard. Original stage Addy, I mean the one with the body, was actually portrayed by the band's management themselves by simply wearing an Addy mask, a leather jacket and doing, you know, whatever the weird things that he's usually doing. And that actually remained so up until 1982 and Iron Maiden's The Beast on the Road tour. An Iron Maiden! Before the band went on that tour, Dave Beasley actually saw a pantomime version of Jack and the Beanstalk, and thus inspired by that play, Dave actually creates the first walk-on Addy, who just basically be a guy on lawn sticks, but dressed up to look like three meters tall. Yet the fact remains that since his first appearance on a band's concert, Addy might actually be the only guy in the world who is not an official band member and did not miss any of Iron Maiden live shows. According to Steve Harris, pretty much everyone in the band referred to the mask, which was to become Eddie eventually, as simply the head, which with their London accents sounded something like the head. And so Ed or Eddie, of course, sounded like the most natural name for the guy. In addition, the band absolutely loved that old joke about a woman who gave birth to a child with absolutely no body and just the head. And the doctor promised that in like five years or something like that, he would come up with a body for him. And so five years later, when his father comes in to the guy's room, room on his birthday and says, hey son, I have a gift for you, the guy answers, oh no, not another hat. <laughs> it's not lame, you're lame. Either way, the funniest thing for me personally is that because Eddie is so humanized and he actually has a real human name, unlike most of the other mascots, I, just like many other Iron Maiden fans around the globe, actually do not really consider him to be a mascot, more like another band member. And this, I believe, is the key to Eddie's success. You see, most of the other band's mascots are actually detached from the band. Yes, they're somewhat intertwined into the story, into the song's lyrics, yada, 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 yet none of them actually have as much connection with both the band and the fans as Eddie the Hat. A new band's album, the next Iron Maiden show, you know Eddie is gonna be right there next to the band. You simply cannot imagine the band without Eddie. Thus, I believe that in a way in which Rod Smallwood and the band were able to humanize their mascot became one of the greatest key factors for the band's success overall. In addition, Iron Maiden were able to use Eddie for the things they would otherwise not be able to do themselves. For example, on a cover of Sanctuary, Eddie can be seen standing over the corpse of Margaret Thatcher, whom we can assume he actually killed. By the way, inspired by Judas Priest's stolen tape trackers for British Steel, and if you have no idea what I'm talking about, make sure to check out the British Steel episode on our Defenders of the Faith series. The band actually released Sanctuary in the United Kingdom with a censored cover, blacking out Thatcher's face, even if no one actually asked them to do so. On a women in uniform, Margaret Thatcher was of course about to take her revenge on Eddie the Hat, who's just casually strolling the streets hugging two young beautiful ladies for which Iron Maiden, of course, were deemed sexist by the feminists. And those, of course, are just a couple of the examples, yet it is absolutely true that throughout the years, Eddie was actually always able to do what others were not. And since he is considered by so many to be a part of this band, it is Iron Maiden who would eventually get the credit. Exactly. Anyways, I could be way overthinking it, so please do let me know in the comments what you personally think of why Eddie is so successful, which Eddie is your personal favorite one, and why is it the one from somewhere back in time. As always, thank you so much for watching, guys, and keep rocking.